lesson today is from Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. There was evening and there was morning. The first day. Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And if you're able, I invite you to stand with me as we read from the Holy Gospel. The Gospel reading for this morning is a reading from St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. John the Baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. People from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. On high school, I had the same coach for basketball and for the spring athletic season, track and field. And uh, before every season, Started, we would have this meeting. Our coach would call us in and we'd either meet in the locker room or sometimes it was the gymnasium and it would kind of be the same every year. Our coach would walk into the room and we'd all get just incredibly quiet and then he'd pause for just a moment, I think for dramatic effect, and then he'd look around the room and he'd look each of us directly in the eyes, and then he would say, I've got a feeling. I've got a feeling. This year is going to be the year. This year is going to be the year. And of course, by saying that, we immediately thought as players that he meant that this year we were going to win the state championship and our coach was going to lead us to that victory. It only took me hearing this speech a couple of times and not winning the state championship, I mean not by a long shot, but I began to doubt the accuracy of my coach's feeling. But every year it was the same. This year is going to be the year. This year is the year. And every year, even though our experience was to the contrary, we still had a little glimpse of that hopefulness. We were hopeful that he was right, that this year was going to be the year, and we believed him. Of course, when he was talking about this year being the year, he wasn't talking about winning the state championship, though that would have been a great thing. I think he was talking about more important things. I think he was trying to lead us into becoming better people. He was trying to say that this year you will become a better person. This year you will work for something that isn't just about you, but it is about a community. And he tried to lead us in that, to become better, to care for each other, to learn from each other to be part of something that was bigger than just what was in it for us. 
That's really what he meant when he said this year is going to be the year. And I think there is, even at the beginning of the year, as we embark on a new season and as we embark on a new year, 2015 ourselves, there is this kind of sense of optimism that's rallied in us and rallied around us. There is this honest hope that this year will be the year that we are finally able to change in the ways that we long desired to change. And this theme of change is certainly something we see play out in Scripture. The very first words of Scripture. Listen to them again. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while the wind of God swept over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. So do you see this theme of change even in the first few verses of the Bible? It started with a formless void and darkness covered the face of the earth with God spoke. Let there be light and things were changed. And there was light. And that's how the Bible begins. Not with some philosophic statement on the existence of God. There's actually none of that in the Bible. The Bible begins with a statement of faith. And it's a statement of hope for all of us. There is this optimism that is rallied around us in this very first verses of the Bible. And we know that those verses were written at a very dark time in the history of Israel for people who were trying to make sense of their lives in very dark and dreary circumstances. And the question of the text wasn't written to answer, you know, how exactly and when exactly did we get here? That's not why these words were written at the very beginning of the Bible. They were written to make sense of the circumstances in which they lived. They were written to make sense of their chaotic lives. They were written to make sense of their conflicted lives, to make sense of their confusing lives in which they lived. And so the very first verses of the Bible speaks of this change, to try to understand this God, this good and gracious God that comes to us, who created the world and called it good, how this God comes to us over and over again and tries to help us make sense of our lives. That's how the beginning of the Bible starts. The beginning of the New Testament, in the Gospel of Mark, it simply says the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, and then it moves into a baptism. Jesus' baptism. And what a baptism. It is. All of my baptisms have been indoors. I've been asked whether or not I would do a baptism outside. I've been asked to baptize a child in the Lacaparle River, actually. Not this time of year. But there was interest by the family to have a baptism at the river. I've never done a baptism. I've never officiated at a baptism. I shouldn't say done a baptism, because God does the baptism, right? God does baptisms. I don't know. I just get to officiate. I'm fortunate enough to officiate at baptisms. But I've never even done an outdoor baptism. All of my baptisms have been inside, in a building where there's been a ceiling and walls and there's been heat and good looking, well dressed people. The baptisms that I have done have all been relatively safe spaces. When Jesus was baptized, it was not a safe space. Jesus was baptized in a river. So I want you to think about that. A baptism in a river. Think of, maybe not the Lagoparo River, but maybe think of the Mississippi River. Think of the wilderness. It says over and over again that Jesus was baptized in the wilderness, in a river. A dangerous space. That's where Jesus was baptized. 
in a confusing space, a conflicted space, maybe even a chaotic space. Jesus was baptized in a river. For those of us whose baptisms tend to involve gorgeous baptismal fonts and just a small amount of water poured on a sweet-smelling baby's head, this is really in drastic contrast to how we experience baptisms today. Jesus' baptism was not a safe baptism at all. In fact, when we think about Jesus' baptism as a real jolt to our type and form of baptism that we celebrate, Jesus' baptism involved a baptizer dressed in camel skin, fresh from a dinner of wild honey and bugs, and he's dunking Jesus' body in the muddy river of the Jordan. And there is a wildness about John the baptizer, and there's a wildness about rivers, there's a wildness about creation, and there is a wildness about baptism that we sometimes forget. When Jesus was baptized, he sees the heavens torn apart, not just open as the Gospel of Matthew and Luke declare. Jesus saw the heavens torn apart. That's not a safe space either. In fact, that's kind of a dangerous word, isn't it? The heavens being torn apart. In Isaiah 64, the cry goes up, Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. That is the Israelites' prayer to God, that God would tear open the heavens and come down. It is the heart's cry of God's people, and it is our cry as God's people, that God would tear open the heavens and come down, that God would tear open the heavens and be with us in our chaotic world. That is our yearning for God to come among us and to right all the wrongs. It is our yearning for God to come among us, to lift up the poor, to set the captives free, to bring power to the oppressed, and to heal all of those who are ill and are oppressed. That is the cry of our part, that God would open the heavens up and come down. When Jesus was baptized, the heavens were torn apart. And God came down. And these words were bestowed upon Jesus. You are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. And that has more often than not been the focus of the baptisms, the safe baptisms that take place here in the sanctuary. But at the river, at the river, when we think of Jesus' baptisms, these words are not only marked as comforting words, but they're also marked as scary words. At Jesus' baptism, he's given not just an identity, but Jesus is also given a mission. And his mission is not just comforting, but Jesus' mission is a dangerous mission. The mission drives Jesus back to the wilderness to wrestle with the devil, and it leads him out to places of suffering, it leads him out to places of chaos, to places of a despairing people where Jesus will minister to. And the images that come to mind of this Jesus being sent out on this, this mission is, is, at least the image that comes to my mind, is like those firefighters that had to go out on a cold night and those emergency personnel that had to go out on that cold night last week on Tuesday night. It was their mission in a very dangerous situation to put out a fire. It was a dangerous mission, and so that's the imagery that comes to my mind. When Jesus was baptized, it was this type of mission that Jesus was given. For when God hears the cries of the world, as God hears the cries of all of creation, God sends Jesus armed with the power of the Holy Spirit and with his identity and mission as the Son of God. And when God hears the cries of the world, as God hears the cries of all of creation, guess what? He sends you out as well. He sends you out as baptized people. 
bearing that same mission and that same identity as God's beloved child to go into those places of chaos and conflict. And it's a dangerous mission. It's a dangerous mission for all of us as children of God. The baptisms that I officiate are tame baptisms compared to the baptism in which we are all called. I hope that this year will be the year. That's my hope. That this year will be the year for all of us to know the depth of what God calls us to in our baptisms. Thanks be to God.